Okay. All right, all right, all right. And I hope everybody can hear me. Um, sorry for the slight delay. Um, I thought I was ready to go online there. I had spent quite a bit of time earlier today because I changed computers, setting everything up, checking everything, making sure I had the uh, all the proper stuff. Um, by the way, let me know if there's any problems with hearing me or anything since I've had to completely rearrange everything. Um, the one thing I did not realize was that I had not reconnected to uh, where I actually wanted the broadcast to go. So I'm clicking go live again and again, and it's not doing anything. And it's giving me this other little thing off to the side saying, choose destination. Anyway, so I hope you've all found it. I hope it's here. I hope you can see me and hear me. Uh, why you would want to do that is beyond me, but it's completely back to you. Um, give you a quick uh, update and um, all that stuff. Um, about last week, uh, in a nutshell, I've been going through, well, you've all seen my wrist braces and stuff. I'm going through a lot of inflammatory stuff for the last few months. And it got markedly worse uh, a few weeks back. And then um, all, of a, all of a sudden, um, I got like a, you know, just a normal pinched nerve tweak thing in the neck that you get from sleeping wrong or something. But it kind of like spread all over my everything. So things that were already bad because of the inflammation, because inflammation tends to turn into a chain of different inflammatory reactions and all over your immune system and particularly with me and my joints, um, all the stuff that had already been um, difficult suddenly got even more whatever, swollen, inflamed, I don't know. And it, it was amazing. I mean, horrifying, but amazing. I kept wondering, you know, is, is this it? Is this now like some weird thing that's kicked in the way that, you know, some people get Parkinson's or MS or something in, in you know, late middle age, he said euphemistically. Um, anyway, so there I was. I mean, I like had gotten to the point where I could barely get out of the bed. I couldn't stand up without like finding something to lift myself with. Uh, it was actually kind of scary. Um, as I said, not so much the thing itself, although that was very painful and debilitating, but the idea that like, crap, maybe this is going to be permanent. Um, you know, I can't type without pain. I can't do anything without pain. So um, I'm actually only wearing these primarily today as just, um, you know, for like holding a book for long stretches and just kind of in a more, uh, what we would say, prophylactic way, just to prevent anything worse happening again. But, um, you know, so I, I eventually got to the, and I'd been to the doctor several times and because I have, a, it's a new medical service thing that we joined, um, you know, they have to kind of start over again with everything. So I'd spent weeks going to new appointments, seeing blah, 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 rheumatologists, orthopedic doctors, etc. And um, finally got to the point where after this last thing where I, like my entire body was just seized up on me and um, went in to get, uh, went into the emergency room. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure this thing doesn't accidentally shut up, shut me down here. I don't know why it's giving me this crap on the side. Um, there's always something. Uh, and anyway, so there I was and went to the emergency room. And by the end of about four or five hours in the emergency room, because they're having a very busy day, um, got a shot in my wrist, which I'd been wanting for a few weeks and got some muscle relaxants. And darned if I didn't feel like 90% of my normal self by the end of the day. So that's a, a bullet dodged, I guess. Um, although mortality has its eye on us all, um, that, that at, you know, fairly normal now, fairly normal, as normal as I ever am, which admittedly is a somewhat dubious proposition. But so I am very glad to be here with you again and to have nothing worse going on than, uh, than there has been. And um, 
extremely pleased that there's nothing worse going on than there has been and to be back with you to read to you, which I will be doing fairly shortly. Um, also, as usual, I'm back to work again. Um, I was always kind of doing a little work. I just couldn't work for very long. So I'm um, still working on Navigator's Children. Um, what else? It's basically it, you know, just, oh, and if, I, as soon as I was well enough to do so, I had to go climb up onto the, down to the, up, up the hill of our property and go find the broken fence because the dog has been being kept inside for days upon days. Um, so I found the broken fence and fixed that. So that was just such a pleasure to be able to do something useful and practical um, and especially useful for poor Johnny, who just is not, he's a big dog. And even though he's now a middle-aged dog, he really loves to get out and run and bark at trucks going past and all the things a dog really loves. So, yeah, that's it, basically. Um, scary couple of months and then especially the last week or two. And um, at the moment, feeling a heck of a lot better and uh, fairly normal and glad that what I thought was going on, which was massive inflammation thing um, is in fact all there was and uh, I'm very much uh, pleased to see that that seemed to be the case. I wish I could get rid of this thing. I, they're always putting new things up. <laughs> I didn't want this. I don't know why it's here. Um, I certainly don't want any of that. There we go. Okay. Made it go away. Um, anyway, so let me check in with everybody and say hello. So Ronnie, hello. Good morning to you. Pleasure to see you. Rosalba. Good morning. Good morning. Suzanne checking in from Yorkshire. Hello. Olaf. Hello, my friend. Good to see you. Good morning to you. Anamika. I'm very happy to be feeling better too, believe me. And uh, thank you for the kind words. Holger. Good morning to you. And thank you. I'm not still on drugs because of you. I'm on drugs because drugs are actually useful. Um, you know, I, I'm very grateful to live in an age where we have things like muscle relaxants that are, I mean, even 10, 15 years ago when I would occasionally have to take them or, or you know, for, uh, you know, this kind of thing in the past, they were always stuff that was in the Valium family. And um, the problem with those is, first of all, they make you a little bit dopey. Um, as I well know from back in my days when I used to have to take them to be able to fly, um, not me fly personally, but, you know, in an airplane. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, they're also, they're addictive. They are potentially very addictive and they have really been problems for some people. And, uh, I had always been very careful with them. But uh, I'm still glad that now they have, you know, muscle relaxants that don't seem to have that effect at all. I don't notice any, anything other than, you know, the muscle suddenly kind of going, oh, we can get out of panic mode now. <laughs> you know, we're not under attack. Um, so, yeah, I'm actually very glad to be on drugs. And I was never on drugs because of you nice people. That was not why I had to take drugs or why I ever would want to take drugs. Um, nice people, readers, friends, that those are my drugs. Well, more or less. Anyway, <laughs> Cliff, hello. Nice to hear from you. Mark, good morning to you and glad to be here. Hello, Ilva, Ilva. And you feel a bit crappy this morning? Yes, I hope it's not the plague either. Um, don't, don't have the plague. I, I strong, I'm not a medical professional, mind you. But I still say having the plague, not a good plan. So you can quote me on that. Anamika, hello, hello. If I didn't say hello to you already and good morning to you. Kristen, hello, very good to see you and greetings to you. Let's see, uh, Wouter, hello Wouter. And good evening, good morning to you. Christina, hello, good morning to you. And who else is here? My mother-in-law, Hazel. Hello, sweetie. Yes, as I've been saying at some length, I don't know if you heard me. I'm, I'm doing much, much better. Um, it was a really nasty few weeks, but um, yeah, pretty good now. 
your daughter's kind of sad today. Um, I hope that is a momentary thing. I, I, not due to any particular thing, I don't think. Just, you know, just weather. Um, but uh, she is still very loved. So that at least is still good. Who else? Iris. Hello, Iris. Good to see you. James. James D. Scott, who has been completely, who's completely hung over after celebrating the election results in Oz. Um, without, as I always said, I try to stay away from politics in this particular venue, um, but I'm very happy about those results as well. So um, Scott Morrison was not one of my favorite world leaders. Let's put it that way. Um, okay, who else have we got here? Have I said hello to everybody? Now they're all talking to themselves. There's Jeremy. Hello. Oh, Jeremy, I'm with you. I had to set up a whole bunch of stuff to be able to be here this evening because I changed computers and I had to figure out all these because the new new computers, different cabling and ay, way complicated. And plus, I think I have some idea of some of the problems I was having before with the sound, but I'm still having problems with my one of my microphones. So I'm using my other microphone. It's a jungle out there. Let me tell you, folks. Um, okie dokie 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 dokie. Um, anyway. All right. So I've said hello to everybody. So anything else I needed to tell you guys about? What are the important things? I'm okay. Johnny's doing much better because he can go outside now without having to be on a leash, which is very important for a large dog. The small dog never noticed. The cat, of course, never goes out anyway, even when I leave the door open down here and say, you can go outside if you want to, you know, and she just kind of looks at it and Occasionally, she'll go out onto the back sort of porch outside my sliding glass door and sniff around a little bit. And then she kind of wanders back in. So as I think I've told you, she's not a cat who had a lot of experience of the outside world and or in fact of having much space at all. So, um, you know, I just humor her. That's what I want people to do for me when I get old and fat is just humor me. <laughs> you know, if I'm happy in one room then leave me alone. And if I want to go outside, let me go outside. That's, you know, I'm just making this all clear now, folks. This is kind of like a living will after going through a health crisis for the past few weeks. Um, I just want everybody to know that when my time comes and I can no longer make my own decisions, just put me in a nice room and let me go out when I want to and feed me regularly and brush me. <laughs> I mean, that's what I do for the cat. So, I mean, you know, brush my little triangular beard thing or something. Anyway, so, oh, I shouldn't turn it to that side. It's funny. It's like, not only is this thing really drive me nuts when I'm looking at it in the camera here or in the, the, the picture, but then, of course, I always reach up and push it the wrong direction to make it worse and turn it into like a little comma or something. Anyway, okay, so have I said everything I need to say? I think so. I'm glad to have you all back. I'm glad to be back. Um, I hope everything is working well technically. I think I've solved most of the problems. And so forward I will go. Okay? Okay. So we are going to continue reading. Where we were, as I recall, was um, Rini and Kabu and Martin and Orlando and... Um, Fredericks were, had all reached um, Bolivar Atasco's Golden City. They were um, finally beginning to learn. Mr. Sellers appeared. They were finally beginning to learn how the whole thing had happened, how Sellers had, had tracked them down and various things like that. And um, then in the midst of all that, we also were watching Dredd, who is, was running some kind of a mission, an attack mission on a small island. Well, it turns out those are one in the same places, except one is the virtual world that the Atascos have built for themselves, and the other is the actual real world place that they live, that Dredd and his uh, armed henchmen are attacking. And... At the very end of it, the Atasco Sims, their avatars, whatever you want to call them, both suddenly shut down, stopped moving, froze, and a mysterious voice came on and said, what did it say? It said, basically, 
trying to leave would be a very bad idea. I'm afraid the Atascos have left early, but don't worry. We'll think of ways to keep the party entertaining. So that is what was happening. So now we have Dread, who is um, attacking the place. And that's who we're continuing with. Okay? Okay. So, resistance was stiff at the front portico of the main house. But Dread was not in such a hurry now. Oh, and we also learned about a little bit about the history of Dread's telekinetic twist with which he can affect um, inanimate objects. Not, not people, at least not directly, but inanimate objects. Electronics, particularly, is where Dread's, whatever you want to call it, his, he calls it his twist, um, is, is actually effective. And he's been using it to be able to mess with uh, various things in the island's defenses, but more importantly, with the Atasco's um, computer network. Resistance was stiff at the front portico of the main house, but Dredd was not in such a hurry now. His target was still locked into his simulation, and since Celestino had remotely sealed the door locks and thrown a data blanket over the target to prevent incoming calls from security, Sky God, Atasco, had no idea that his castle had been stormed. If nothing else, Dredd admired Atasco's new security service for honoring their contract. They were fighting fiercely. The half dozen pouring fire out of the hardened guardhouse beside the front door seemed capable of holding off an army far larger than Dredd's. However, good security work required more than bravery. Foresight was important too. One of the assault team managed to jam an incendiary grenade through a gun port, although he sustained a fatal wound in the process. When it exploded a moment later, the heat was so fierce that even the steel plex windows softened and bulged outward. The Track 2 team, which had come in through the back of the complex to attack the main security office, was going to be a little while getting free, but Dredd was quite satisfied. Out of two 15-man assault teams, he had only three units down that he knew of, and only one of those three killed, with the action 75% done. Against the kind of security package a rich bastard like Atasco could afford, that was more than acceptable. As his two bang men hired, wired hemispheres of Anvax hammer gel to the massive front door, he allowed himself a few moments with his unsuspecting target. Brotherhood has built the most powerful, sophisticated simulation network imaginable. So we've gone back in time now that we're in Dredd's point of view. It was the calm, high voice again coming from someone standing near Atasco. At the same time, they have manipulated and injured the minds of thousands of children. I still have no idea why. In fact, I summoned you here, all of you, in hopes that together we might discover some answers. Dredd was getting more and more intrigued. If Atasco wasn't leading this little conspiracy, who was? Did the old man know things had gone so far? The explosive gel was triggered. A flash of fire briefly eliminated the bodies scattered on the porch as the main door sagged and fell inward. Dredd turned off the window, feeding him the target's visuals. The audio channel was briefly usurped by an announcement of Track 2's successful conquest of the security office. This is it, gentlemen, he said cheerfully. We forgot our invitations. We forgot our invitations, so we'll just have to let ourselves in. Once through the scorched door frame, he stopped for a moment to inspect the piles of rubble and powder that had been a collection of Mayan stonework installed by sad chance too near the front door. He detailed most of his crew to look for stray security and to round up the household staff, then took a bang man and two commandos and headed for the basement lab. As the, as the explosives man knelt in front of the lab door, Dredd tuned in again to what had become a confusing welter of voices. Trek three, he said, in just about a minute, the target's going to be free. I want you to keep it open, whatever it takes, and to hold the rest of the guests in the simulation, if possible, while we figure out who they are. Is that clear? Yes, I understand. 
Celestino sounded tensely excited, which gave Dredd a brief moment of unease. But the Colombian was doing all right so far. It was the rare and exceptional person who didn't get at least a little worked up while participating in a large-scale armed criminal assault. Dredd and the others retreated back down the hallway. Then the bang man thumbed his transmitter. The walls trembled only a little as the hammer gel bent the heavy security door into a curl like stale bread. They kicked it aside and entered. The white-haired man who had been reclining in a pillowy chair had apparently felt the vibration of the controlled blast and was struggling to his feet. His wife, on the far side of the lab in her own chair, was still submerged in VR, twitching gently. Bolivar Atasco stumbled a little, still not completely separated from the, from the simulation and its override on his exterior physical responses. He paused, swaying, and stared at Dredd as though he felt he should recognize him. You have just met the angel of death, and he's a stranger. He is always a stranger. The line from some obscure interactive popped into Dredd's mind and made him grin. As Atasco opened his mouth to speak, Dredd flicked a finger, and the nearest commando shot the anthropologist between the eyes. Dredd stepped forward and pulled the jack out of Atasco's neuro cannula, then gestured at the woman. The other soldier did not move toward her, but thumbed his troner to auto fire and sprayed her down, blowing the cable out of her neck and sending her to the floor in a bloody heap. Mission accomplished. Dredd surveyed the two bodies briefly, then sent the two commandos upstairs to rejoin the others. He checked back in on the simulation in time to hear a new voice. Trying to leave would be a very bad idea. It was an unfamiliar voice processed. It took him several moments to realize it was Celestino's. I'm afraid the Atascos have left early, the gear man was saying through Atasco's usurped sim. But don't worry. We'll think of ways to keep the party entertaining. You shit, Dredd screamed. You bloody idiot. Get out of there! There was no response. Celestino was not listening to the command channel. Dread felt rage expanding inside him like scalding steam. Dulcie, are you there? I am. Have you got a gun? Uh, yes. Her voice suggested she always carried one, but didn't use it. Go in and shoot that little bastard. Right now. Shoot? Now! He may have just blown the most important part of this whole thing sky high. Do it. You know I'll take care of you. Already high, in Dredd's estimation, Dulcinea Anwin rose even higher. He did not hear another sound from her until after something had exploded loudly on the Track 3 audio channel. Now what? She was back on the line, breathing hard. Christ, I've never done that before. Then don't look at it. Go back to the other room. You can override from there. I want to know who's in that simulation. Find the outside lines. More importantly, I want one of those lines, just one that we can spike. She took a ragged breath and steadied. Got it. While he waited, Dredd examined the Atasco's lab. Expensive stuff. In other circumstances, he wouldn't have minded taking some of it with him, although it would have been strictly against the old man's orders. But he smelled a bigger prize. He gestured to the bang man who was standing in the hallway, smoking a skinny black cigar. Wire it up. The man ground the cigar out on the floor, then began attaching nodules of Anvax gel to various points around the room. Once Dredd and Dulcie had emptied out the contents of Atasco's hard storage, he would trigger the explosives remotely. As he was making his way back up the stairs, Dulcie Anwin came back online. I've got good news and bad news. Which first? His grin was reflexive, hunger rather than humor. I can take the bad news. There hasn't been much so far tonight. Can't get a fix on most of these folks. 
There seem to be several different setups, but most of them are trace proof. They're not puppets, I don't think, but they're using some kind of blind relay system. At least a couple of anonymous routers involved, plus some other even weirder stuff. If I had them all in one place for a couple of days, I might break something down, but otherwise, forget it. They're already starting to scatter. They'll probably be offline in a few minutes, but you said most. Is that the good news? I've got one of them in the crosshairs. Guessed it in by the target. No relay, no weird runaround. Spike's already in place. Dredd took a deep breath. Great. That's perfect. I want you to do a quick trace, then pull up the user's index. Can you do that? When do you want it? Right now. I want you to use that spike to override and bump the user offline. Then you hold the sim yourself. Browse the index just quickly. We'll work up a better version later. And learn what you can. Whoever he or she is, that's who you are. Got it? You want me to pretend to be this person? What about all the data work we have to do? I'll do it myself. I need to do it myself. Don't worry, I'll get someone to relieve you in a little while. Hell, after I get the data squared away, I'll probably take that spike from you myself too. The pain in his head, the residue of the twist, was almost completely gone now. Dredd suddenly felt the need for music and conjured up a swelling martial air. He had something the old man didn't. Had it firmly in his jaws, and he was going to hang on to it until doomsday. If any of the others at the conference or whatever it is stay in the simulation, you stay too. Keep your mouth shut. Record everything. He was already busily making plans. As soon as he knew where this user lived, he would have him or her investigated and sanctioned. Not necessarily in that order. He now had a front row seat. Christ, he exalted, a leading role in some mysterious conspiracy that had the old man scared to death. Also, the conspirators seemed to know a lot more about what the old man and his friends were up to than Dredd did himself. It was impossible to guess how valuable this little sleight of hand might turn, might turn out to be. My time has come around at last, he laughed. But he needed everything to be crystal clear foolproof. Even the efficient Ms. Anwin could make a mistake in all this confusion. Are you sure you got it? He asked her. You keep that sim working at all costs until I relieve you. You are that user. Don't worry about the overtime. I'll make it worth your while, Dulcy baby. He laughed again. His early thoughts about Dulcinea as quarry had been superseded by a chase more glorious than anything he could have anticipated. Get on it. I'll be back as soon as I finish up some loose ends here. He strode up the stairs and into the huge entry hall. There was data to sift and a lot of it. He would have to take care of that before following up on the sim, monitor as much of it as he could before it went to the old man and his brotherhood. He suddenly very much wanted to know what Atasco had been doing, as well as what Atasco had known. It would mean another night without sleep, but it would surely be worth it. At the foot of the main staircase, a stone statue of a jaguar, blocky and expressionistic, crouched on a pedestal. He patted its, snar he patted its snarling jaws for luck then made a mental note to add Celestino's body to the cleanup squad's list of things to do. Chapter 38, A New Day. NetFeed News. Critipong, USA demands more seats. Visual, U.S. Capitol Building, Electron, U.S. Capitol Building, Washington, CM. Voiceover. Critipong Electronics USA is threatening to filibuster the U.S. Senate unless it receives more representation. Visual Critipong VPPR Porfirio Vasquez Lowell at press conference. Vasquez Lowell. 
The House of Representatives allots seats based on population, and the biggest states get the most House seats. The Senate is business-based. Kritabong's gross worth has at least quintupled in the decade since the Industrial Senate Amendment was passed. So we deserve more seats. Simple. And we'd like to have a little chat with our colleagues in Britain's House of Enterprise, too. Things had gone from strange to stranger. Orlando, who had roused himself for a few moments to try to make the others understand, now could only sit staring as the room erupted into madness. Their hosts had vanished, the Atascos from their virtual bodies, sellers completely. A woman across the table was screaming, a continuous wail of pain that was both heartbreaking and terrifying. Some of the sim-wearing guests sat like Orlando in stunned silence. Others were shouting at each other like asylum inmates. Fredericks, he turned his throbbing head, looking for his friend. Another wave of the fever was crawling over him, and despite the amazing chaos, he was suddenly fighting the pull of sleep. Fredericks, where are you? He hated the plaintive sound of his own voice. His friend popped up from behind the table, hands over his ears. This whole thing impacts plus, Orlando. We have to get out of here. The shrieking stopped, but the excited babble continued. Orlando pulled himself upright. How? You told me we can't go offline. Besides, didn't you hear what that guy Sellers was saying? Frederick shook his head emphatically. I heard, but I'm not listening. Come on. As he pulled at Orlando's arm, the room suddenly quieted. Over Frederick's shoulder, Orlando saw Atasco moving again. I hope none of you think you're going anywhere. The sim was inhabited, but the voice was not Atasco's. Trying to leave would be a very bad idea. Oh no, Jesus, moaned Fredericks. This is, we're... Something happened at the head of the table, something swift and violent that Orlando couldn't quite make out, but Atasco's wife disappeared from his line of sight. I'm afraid the Atascos have left early, continued the new voice, sounding as pleased with its own evil as any cartoon villain. But don't worry, we'll think of ways to keep the party entertaining. For a long moment, nobody moved. A rustle of frightened murmurs ran through the guests as Atasco, or what had been Atasco, turned to survey them each in turn. Now, why don't you tell me your names? And if you cooperate, maybe I will be kind. The exotic woman Orlando had noted earlier, the tall, hawk-nosed one that he thought of as Nefertiti, shouted, You go to hell! Through a haze of fever, Orlando admired her spirit. With just a little effort, he could almost imagine this as a particularly, particularly complicated and inventive game. If so, Nefertiti was clearly the warrior princess. She even had a sidekick if the talking monkey was with her. And me? Is there a category for dying hero? Fredericks was clutching the arm of Orlando's sim so tightly that he could actually feel pain even through the sickness and machinery. He tried again to shake off his friend's grip. It was time to stand up. It was time to die on his feet in the final battle. Thargor would have wanted to go that way, even if he was only an, an imaginary character. Orlando rose, trembling. The false Atasco's eyes flicked toward him. Then suddenly the feather-crowned head snapped forward as if struck a blow by an invisible club. The god-king body froze again, then toppled swiftly to the floor. The terrified babble of the guests rose once more. Orlando took a few light-headed, staggering steps, then righted himself and headed across the room toward Nefertiti and her monkey friend. He had to push past, he had to push past the black-clad clown who called himself Sweet William, who was arguing with the shiny robot warrior Sim. 
Sweet William shot Orlando a scornful look as they bumped shoulders. That idiot would love the Palace of Shadows, Orlando thought. Hell, they'd probably make him the Pope. As he reached Nefertiti, Fredericks caught up with him, clearly unwilling to be left on his own in the middle of this madness. The dark-skinned woman was crouching beside the woman who had been screaming, holding her hand and trying to soothe her. Do you have any idea what's going on here? Orlando asked. Nefertiti shook her head. But something has obviously gone wrong. I think we must find a way out. He wasn't sure, but he thought her accent sounded African or Caribbean. Finally, somebody who makes sense, Frederick said angrily. I've been... He was interrupted by a shout of surprise. All turned to the front of the room, where the white specter of Sellers' Sim had reappeared. It raised its formless hands in the air, and the people nearest drew back in fear. Please, listen to me. To Orlando's relief, it sounded very much like Sellers. Please, we do not have much time. The Sims crowded forward, already calling out questions. Nefertiti banged her fists on the table and shouted for silence. A couple of others joined her, including Sweet William, Orlando was surprised to see. After a few moments, the room quieted. I do not know how, but we seem to have been discovered. Sellers was laboring to sound calm and just barely succeeding. The island, the Atasco's real world estate, is under attack. Our hosts are both dead. The robot wearer cursed in floridly fluent goggle boy. Someone else shouted out in surprise and fear. Orlando could feel hysteria rising around him. If he had felt like his normal Thargor self, it would be time to start slapping some quiet common sense into some of these ninnies. But not only didn't he feel like Thargor, he was pretty terrified himself. Sellers was riding the panic, holding it down. Please, remember the attack is happening in Cartagena, Colombia, in the real world, not here. You are in no immediate danger, but we cannot be found out, or the danger will be very, very real. I will assume that this attack is the work of the Grail Brotherhood and that they know what they're looking for. If so, we only have minutes before they'll be upon us. So what should we do? It was the monkey, his lilting voice calmer than anyone else's. We have barely begun to speak of other land. Other land? What the hell are you babbling about? shouted the woman who had earlier railed at Atasco. We have to get out of here. How do we go offline? She scrabbled at her neck as though attacked by invisible insects, but plainly could not find her Nero cannula. There was another eruption. Clearly no one else could leave the simulation either. Silence! Sellers raised his hands. We have moments only. If your identities are to be protected, I must do my work. I cannot stay here, and neither can you. Temelun will not be a sanctuary. The Brotherhood will tear it to pieces. You must get out and into other land. I will work to keep you hidden until you can find a way to escape the network entirely. But how will we even get out of this place? Nefertiti, like her four-legged familiar, was doing a good job of controlling her emotions, but Orlando could hear the crack threatening to widen. This Temilun is as big as a small country. Are we going to run to the border? And how do you go from one simulation to another here anyway? The river, the river is the boundary, Sellers said, but it is also, <coughs> excuse me, but it is also a bore, uh, but it is also a route from one simulation to the next. He paused for a moment, thinking, then bent to Atasco's sim where it lay on the flagstones. He came up a moment later with something in his hand. Take this. It's Atasco's signet ring. There is a royal barge, I think, down at the port. I've seen it, 
Orlando called out. It's big. Remember, Atasco is the god king here, the master. If you command it with his ring, they will take you out onto the river. Sellers handed the ring to Nefertiti. Orlando felt another wave of stifling, muzzy warmth roll through his body. His eyes sagged, halfway closed. Just sail on the river, Sweet William demanded. What is this? Huckleberry friggin' Finn. Where are we going? You got us into this, you bloody little man. How are you going to get us out of it? Sellers held out his hands, seeming to offer a benediction more than to plead for silence. There is no more time for talk. Already our enemies are trying to breach the defenses I've thrown together. There is much I still need to tell you. I will do my best to find you again. Find us? Fredericks took a step forward. You're not going to know where we are? There is no time. For the first time, Seller's voice rose to a shout. I must go. I must go. Orlando forced himself to speak. Is there anything we can do to stop these people or at least find out what they're doing? We can't, can't have a quest without something to quest for. I was not prepared for this. Sellers took a ragged breath. His shapeless form seemed to sag. There is a man named Jonas. He was a prisoner of the Grail Brotherhood, his mind held captive in a simulation. I was able to reach him when he dreamed. I helped him to escape. Look for him. We supposed to sniff for this Salo net knocker? The battle robot waved its arms, flashing the razor-sharp blades at its joints. While someone trying to six us? You far, far crash. I can't believe I've got something in common with Bang Bang the Metal Boy here, said Sweet William, a thin edge of panic in his voice. But I agree. What are you talking about? Sellers raised his arms. Jonas knows something. He must. The Brotherhood would have killed him already if he weren't important. Find him. Now go. The chorus of questions began again, but Sellers' sim abruptly flared and then disappeared. Frederick shook his head miserably. This is horrible. Like some kind of story where everything ends wrong. We have to get going. Orlando grabbed his friend's arm. Come on, what choice do we have? He saw that Nefertiti and the monkey were helping their friend to her feet. We're going with them. He stood, taking a moment to be sure he had his balance. The fever had receded a little. He felt weak, but more clear-headed. We're going to the ship, just like Sellers said. Orlando made his voice louder. The rest of you can do what you want, but I wouldn't stay here until they managed to trace me. So if you're coming, follow me. Sweet William swept his cloak back over his shoulder. Oi, sunshine, who died and made you Mr. Happy? Mr. Happy. The monkey had climbed back onto the table. The time for, that time for arguing is over, it said. This man is right. Go or stay. We can't just go charging out of here. Nefertiti was frowning. If we do that, someone will come in to investigate. Investigate? The woman on the other side of the table had a slightly hysterical sound. They're already investigating. He just said so. I'm talking about here, said Nefertiti. Outside in the real world, the Brotherhood or whoever has shut Atasco down. But in here, the people of Temelun don't know they're not real. And they don't care a bit about what's happening in real life. They think we're having a meeting with their king or whatever. If we go thundering out like something's wrong, we'll never make it to the docks. Orlando nodded slowly, revising his earlier high estimation upward. Hide the body, he said. Both the bodies. It took more than a few minutes since within the simulation, the deserted sims had the weight and heft of corpses. 
corpses in advanced rigor mortis, as Orlando noticed while helping to trundle the unwieldy seated form of Mrs. Atasco, which made their task even more difficult. What little strength he had was waning quickly in the struggle with the bodies, and he had no idea how far they would have to travel. He surrendered to Fredericks his position as impromptu pallbearer and joined the search for a hiding place instead. The baboon discovered a small anteroom hidden behind a screen, and the rest gratefully bundled the Atasco's sins into it. Despite Sweet William's obvious discontent, the party then fell into line behind Orlando and Nefertiti. Now act come, the tall woman said as she reached for the door. The guards stepped back as the guests filed out. Orlando saw with approval that Fredericks, though unhappy, was maintaining a stiff but impenetrable expression. Some of the others, however, were not hiding their anxiety quite so well, and the sharp-eyed proximity of the guards was not helping matters. Someone behind Orlando was trying to choke back a sob. The guards heard it too, judging by the way their heads were swiveling to find the source of the noise. Orlando stepped toward what he guessed was the captain, the guard with the highest helmet and longest and most brilliant feathered cape. He searched his game-playing lexicon for words that sounded properly melodramatic. Why is my thing suddenly frozen? Um, hello, can you guys still hear me? My picture is frozen here for some reason I cannot figure out. Hello, could somebody, yes, you can still hear me? Okay, I'll keep reading. I don't know why. Can you see the, the, the image? Huh, weird, my, mine is totally frozen on my end. Anyway, I'll keep reading. Um, Orlando stepped toward what he guessed was the captain, the guard with the highest helmet and longest and most brilliant feathered cape. He scratched, he searched his game playing lexicon for words that sounded properly melodramatic. I have no idea why that happened. Um, it's still not moving on my end. Our requests were refused, he said. The great and holy one in his wisdom has told us the time is not yet correct. He hoped he sounded both disappointed and yet honored beyond belief even to have been granted an audience. Blessed is he. The guard captain cocked an eyebrow. Sweet William stepped forward all tassels and points, and the captain's other eyebrow went up as well, while Orlando's heart traveled in the opposite direction. Yes, blessed is he, said the apparition in black, with a fairly convincing stab at humility. In fact, our poor embassy has angered him. And while he has kindly restrained his wrath so that we may return to our country and tell our masters the God King's will, his displeasure with our masters is great. He commands that we that he will not be disturbed until sunset. Mentally, Orlando put a check beside Sweet William's name. The guy was quick and smooth when he wanted to be. You had to give him that. The captain did not seem entirely convinced. He fingered the stone blade of an axe that, despite evidence of more modern technologies all around, did not look at all ceremonial. But it is already sunset. Ah, said Sweet William, momentarily nonplussed. Sunset. Orlando jumped in. Our command of your tongue is very poor. Doubtless the god king meant sunrise. In any case, he did not wish to be disturbed. Orlando leaned closer in best conspiratorial fashion. A word to the wise. He was very, very unhappy. I would not want to be the man who interrupted his thoughts and made him even more unhappy. The captain nodded slightly, still frowning. Orlando rejoined the line at the back. 
just behind Sweet William. Not bad, Chuck, William stage whispered over his shoulder when they were out of earshot. We could be a team. End of the pier. Leave them laughing. You sing. Keep walking, said Orlando. When they reached the rotunda just inside the front doors, Orlando hurried forward. The tall woman was clearly chafing at the slow pace of her disabled friend, but was doing her best to maintain an air of deliberate dignity. Do you know where we're going from here? Orlando asked in a whisper. Not a clue. She looked at him briefly. What is your name? You said, but I've forgotten. Orlando, what's yours? She hesitated and said, Oh, God, what difference does it make now? Rini. Orlando nodded. I've been calling you Nefertiti. Rini is easier. She gave him a strange look, then after a moment looked down at her long-fingered hand. Ah, the sim. Right. She glanced up. The huge doors loomed. Now what? Do we just mill around in front trying to figure out where the docks are? But even if we find out, how do we get there? I know they have buses. I, I rode on one, but somehow it seems like a strange idea trying to escape for your life by bus. Orlando pushed at the doors but could not get them open. Fredericks added his weight and they swung wide, revealing a mall lined with street lamps stretching out from the bottom of the wide staircase. Orlando was already feeling a little short of breath. Escaping by bus won't be the strangest thing that happened to us so far, he said. And it probably won't be the worst either, noted Fredericks. Felix Jongleur, these days more frequently known as Osiris, Lord of Life and Death, was trying to decide where he was. This was not the confusion of someone stupefied or geographically confused, but rather a fairly difficult philosophical proposition. In fact, it was a question with which he often wrestled in idle moments. What he saw all around him was the stark grandeur of the Western Palace, its looming windows filled with eternal twilight. Flanking the table before him stretched the double line of animal faces that represented his collaborators, the Ennead. But even as he took a deep contemplative breath in the Western Palace, his actual flesh and blood lungs were doing their work in a sealed hyperbaric chamber within the highest tower of his secluded Louisiana estate, along with the rest of his body. The lungs were aided in their labors by some of the finest medical equipment that money could buy, for the god's lungs were very, very old. But that was the crux of an entirely different metaphysical inquiry. So, as always, the question remained this. Where was he, Felix Jongleur, that which observed the hot white point at the center of the candle flame? To the extent that his actual body was located in the real world, he was in the southernmost part of the United States. But his mind lived almost entirely in virtual worlds, mostly within his favorite, an imaginary Egypt, complete with a pantheon of gods over which he reigned. So where was he truly? On the shores of Louisiana's Lake Bourne? In a Gothic fantasy castle built on reclaimed swampland? On an electronic network? In an even more fantastical castle in Egypt's mythical west? or in some other place more difficult.
Okay, sounds back on. I've only got a couple minutes of reading. Why are they trying to kill me? Um, anyway, <laughs> Holger is sending me messages saying that it's okay when because he likes my facial expressions when something doesn't work. <laughs> Happy to be able to provide cheer. By the way, with no explanation whatsoever, my camera on my end is working again. I hope you guys can hear me. Can, can you guys hear me so I can read this last couple of sentences and then finish up for the night? Somebody send me a message if you can hear me now. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. Otherwise, I'll just say goodnight and wrap up. Yes. Okay. Good. Sorry about this. I li literally have no idea why that happened. Maybe I hit something with the back of the book. Anyway. Okay. So. What happened in this gathering would affect not only his own life's ambition, but quite possibly the very history of humankind. The Grail Project, when completed, would have almost unbelievable ramifications, so it was critical he retained control. His own determined vision had prevailed for so long that the project might well fail without him. He wondered if some of the resistance to his long role, rule over the Brotherhood might be nothing more than a craving for novelty. For all their wealth and immense personal power, the Ennead had proven themselves to possess many other quite human frailties, and it was difficult to restrain, restrain and it was difficult to retain patience for a project that had stretched over so many years. Perhaps he hadn't given them enough showmanship lately. He was distracted by a movement down the table. A grotesque form with the shining head of a beetle rose and coughed politely. If uh, we may begin. Jean Glure was again Osiris, the lord of life and death inclined his head. First of all, the beetle man said, it is a pleasure to be in your company once more, to be among equals. The round brown head turned to make a careful survey. The god could barely refrain from laughing out loud. Um, the god could barely refrain from laughing out loud at the attempts at political dignity, seriously undercut by goggling opaque eyes and quivering mandibles. Osiris had chosen Ricardo Clement's god persona well. The beetle Kepera was an aspect of the solar deity, but for all that, he was still a dung beetle a creature that spent its life rolling little balls of shit, which described the Argentinian perfectly. We have much to discuss today, so I will not take up time with unnecessary talk. Clement bobbed like a shopkeeping insect out of a children's book, a particularly apt simile since his immense fortune had come out of black market, black market organ farming. Then don't. Sekhmet shot her claws and daintily scratched her chin. What is your business? If the beetle had possessed recognizable facial features, the look he gave her might have been more effective. I would like to ask the chairman for a progress report on the Sky God project. And I think I'm going to stop there. Before anything else goes wrong, and for some reason, I hope that you continued to hear that to the end. Um, once again, the camera feed has just stopped on my end, but I, I don't know. There's so many weirdnesses, but this is new weirdness. So this may be compatibility with the new computer. Anyway, so um, that's we are. I think we only probably have one more night's reading and then we're going to be done. Um, so I'll probably finish up tomorrow night. Um, it's very weird because on my end, as I said, things keep freezing and doing and freezing and doing and whatnot. And we lost the sound for reasons I'm not quite sure about. Um, I hope I'll have some of this straightened out soon. Um, I, in fact, changed computers in large part to try and not have uh, some of these problems. <laughs> Oh, I amuse myself. I amuse myself. Anyway, so um, with that, and again, with no idea whatsoever why I still have a frozen 
image feed in front of me, a uh, frozen video feed when I haven't hit the disable camera or done anything like that. Whatever, we'll figure it out as we go. Um, thank you again for joining me. Take good care of yourselves, your loved ones, your friends, the people around you. Um, I will be back at 7 p.m. to probably finish City of Golden Shadow. And then after that, we'll maybe have a conversation next week or something. I won't just disappear. Uh, one way or the other, you will hear from me before, while I take a break. But I may come back next week and then take a break. We'll see. Anyway, but as I said, um, check in with me on social media and I will keep you apprised of what's going on. I'm definitely going to be coming back. There will still be things happening. It's more a question of me thinking um, about what it is that I want to do to make it work. Um, and where I can go from here. So anyway, again, thank you for being patient with me while all kinds of weird things happen. That seems to be more the norm than the exception at the moment. Um, and I will see you very soon. So thanks again for joining me and have a good night or a good morning or a good afternoon or a good eternity in whatever timeless place you may inhabit, wherever you may be. Ciao.